I'm new to the organization as a volunteer. My name is Mike Dasnay. I live out in the Little River area with my wife. Uh, and I'm happy to be here today to uh, welcome you all. Uh, our mission at the museum is to honor veterans. So if we could have our veterans in the audience please stand for a round of recognition. Thank you very much, Greg. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be standing before you. And, and I'm not going to lie, when you say something like that, I get a little choked up. I'm not going to lie. I, I feel every bit of this. So I'm looking, I'm really looking, that's what I'm looking forward to this, uh, to do this talk. So, um, and I'm very humbled to be on the list of speakers. We had a really, the first three speakers were remarkably credentialed speakers, and uh, to be included on that menu, so to speak, is uh, pretty humbling. Uh, but my name is Jeff Brewer. We will be talking about the Battle of Bunker Hill, and I wanted to first uh, get out there some thank yous before I get started. As Greg mentioned, our sponsors, but also Emmett Casiato for his hard work in founding uh, this museum. Mike McCarthy and Janice Allen, dear friends, encouragers, neighbors, publicists, uh, mentor, I mean, 
just, I couldn't ask for better neighbors and people encouraging me to say, hey, you can do this. So here I am. Um, also, I wanted to give a shout out to Larry and Jill Chapman for encouraging me to join SAR, Son, Sons of the American Revolution, and quite frankly, prodding me a bit, which I needed. Um, but thank you for that. And uh, Larry, some of the wool just came in the mail today. So I will be joining you in that color guard eventually. Um, also here from Hendersonville are my folks. Dick and Jean Brewer there in the back. And, uh, I, really, I really want my mom to take a bow. Mom, you can stand up. Because honestly, honestly, if I'm completely honest, she's a lifelong genealogist, a lover of history, and she instilled that in all three of her sons. And quite frankly, without her, I'm not up here. I mean, let's be honest. So um, really, it, it's because of her that I'm even able to have the interest to get into this. And then finally, but not last, at least my life partner, Andrea, honey, wave. <laughs> um, as, as we say in, in my family, um, you know, more is better. So when I get into something, I get into it all the way, kind of like my mom. And I've been working on this for a while, so it, it kind of dominates. But, um, okay, I got the thank yous. So, a little bit about me real quick. Uh, Andrea and I retired here five years ago. We live up in Conesty. Uh, for 30 years, I worked in the sports and media industry, all, all facets of it. And in the last seven years of my career, I taught college classes. Four years in Ohio, I taught sport administration. Three years here in North Carolina, I taught business administration, personal finance, corporate finance, classes like that. So honestly, this feels like a class right now. If it had been filled out all the way to the back, I might have been more nervous, but this feels very comfortable. This is a number you have in a class. It feels very comfortable. And and familiar to me. So my hope today is that, and what time is it right now? 2.10. My hope today is that we break for questions at 3 o'clock. I'm hoping you will have maybe an enhanced or a slightly deeper understanding, appreciation for the American Revolution, the Battle of Bunker Hill, and the early stages of it. Um, so that, that's my hope, is that when we're done, you'll have that feeling. Um, okay, so without further ado, okay, the Battle of Bunker Hill, June 17th, 1775. I'm going to ask the young people that are here, What's the first thing about that date that jumps out at you? June 17th, 1775. Does anything jump out at you about that date? It's before the uh, Declaration of Independence. It was before the Declaration of Independence, right? And I think if we have a simplistic view, of the American Revolution, we tend to think all the fighting occurred after the Declaration of Independence, which as many of you know, is not true. Stop to think, that is a full year plus before the Declaration of Independence. So the Battle of Bunker Hill has to rank among the two or three, if not the most important battle in the shaping of our nation's history. If you really think about it, it and I've read a lot about it, and I thought a lot about it, and there's no doubt in my mind. If this had gone differently, our whole history, the whole push for independence, John Adams on the floor of the Continental Congress, it's a whole different ball game if this goes differently. So what we need to understand about Bunker Hill, and you read about accounts of it, no two accounts are the same. It's a very misunderstood, very confused battle. Even in the two or three days after it, what had come out of it 
was unclear. Those who fought in the battle on the colonial side thought it was an embarrassing loss until they saw the casualties. And if the casualty rates out of this battle had been flipped, it would have been folly to be on the floor of the Continental Congress lobbying to take on the Redcoats and fight for independence. But this was a confidence booster. Huge. When, they, when the full realization of what had happened on that day was accounted. So quickly, the casualties. On the British side, depending on what report you read, anywhere from 1,050 to 1,500, with 230 killed in action, including 19 officers. On the colonial side, 450 casualties, 115 killed in action. So the British, any way you measure it, double the casualties, double the number of killed in action. And when those tallies were looked at, the colonials, even though they had given up the ground, realized, wow, we can stand toe to toe with the greatest fighting force in the world at that time. So if you'll go with me and believe the importance of the Battle of Bunker Hill in, in our fight for independence, when you go one step further and understand that without this gentleman, Bunker Hill is totally different. How many of you have heard of Colonel William Prescott? Okay, good. Well, it took 106 years to finally realize, with that statue being dedicated in 1881, what took so long. If time permits, which it probably won't, but if time permits, I'd like to drill down on that a little bit. And if not, we're going to do it on August 13th when I speak at the SAR lunch in over at Hog Wild. But it took 106 years to sort out what happened on that day and realize, you know, I think we've been honoring and commemorating maybe not the right person. And you talk about the fog of war and the misunderstandings of what happened. We didn't have media. We didn't have, it, it, it was really hard to sort out. I read an account this morning from 1925, and they were still trying to sort it out. But what's been concluded is that William Prescott was the hero of the day. And very few people maybe realize that. So. The discussion outline, and I'm going to fly through the early part of this, a little bit of a foundation, what I call the slow boil, the Boston campaign, which all occurred before the Declaration of Independence, my family connection to it, and then um, talk specifically about Bunker Hill. And if time permits the aftermath, but I'm already figuring that's not going to happen. Okay, so foundation. Population. The population of the colonies in 1625 was about 2,000. The population in 1775 was between 2.4 and 2.5 million. Philadelphia was the biggest city in the colonies at 40,000. New York was at about 25,000. And Boston was somewhere between about 16 and 18,000 population. I say that because a lot of people who maybe we want to discredit or show that there wasn't a groundswell for independence, have quoted the figure that only 3% of the country really supported it. And what they, what they were doing in that was the army divided by the population. But the, the truth remains, and some of you probably know this, that the majority of colonists did not support the revolution. It was fewer than half. At its peak, it was probably maybe 45%. Also, when I quote those population numbers, that does include slaves at, a, at about 16 to 18% of the population. It does not include Native Americans. And understand that 20% of the population in 1775 was concentrated in Virginia. Virginia was a key, key state. The Great Awakening, 1739 to 1741, was essentially a co colonial-wide religious revival. 
which kind of planted the seed that you could, you could push back against conventional thinking. In this case, it was the idea that you could have a relationship with God absent the minister, which was crazy thought for that time. But it planted that thought that you could have a, a uh, you could question authority, or you could question convention. French and Indian War. You really can't talk about the Revolutionary War with at least talking briefly about the French and Indian War. Understand that the debt that Great Britain incurred during the French and Indian War, they then tried to recoup with the taxes that brought about the Revolutionary War, okay? Also what came out of the French and Indian War was the training that so many of our officers in the Revolutionary War gained, was gained during the French and Indian. George Washington, William Prescott, Colonel Jonathan Brewer were all veterans of the French and Indian War and had achieved at a very high rate and brought that knowledge into the Revolutionary War. Another key point out of the French and Indian War, and this especially applies to Thomas Gage, who was calling the shots for the British in the early stages, was a complete lack of respect for the militia, the colonial forces. They felt they were untrained, undisciplined, just they looked down their noses at them, and that played to our advantage in the early stages. And then finally, smallpox. We've just gone through COVID, and yes, it, 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 it's been terrible. Think about this. During all the early stages of the revolution, smallpox was killing at a rate of 7 to 30%. That's going on in the background throughout this whole time is smallpox. They had to deal with that on top of everything else. It's really hard to fathom how tough our ancestors were. Slow boil. So we talked about the taxation. I really want to focus on this one right here. The Sons of Liberty, the Boston Tea Party, as you know, that was when things started to really ramp up. And following the Boston Tea Party, which was led by um, Samuel Adams. Then we get to the appointment of this guy, Thomas Gage, who was gonna come in and crack down. And the colonists referred to the intolerable acts, the punitive penalty that the colonists, Massachusetts, Boston, had to pay for the Boston Tea Party. And that's when things went to another level with Thomas Gage. Did we all know who that is? That's John Hancock, John Adams, Samuel Adams. And I, I put in here Abigail Adams because when John Adams was serving in the Continental Congress, she was his eyes and ears back in Massachusetts. Here's what's happening, John. Details, details, details. Their letter writing is unbelievable, the amount of letters that have been saved. And uh, the sacrifice that, that that couple made, it's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But um, Abigail Adams and her son, seven-year-old John Quincy, who was a future president, watched the Battle of Bunker Hill from a high point 10 miles away. So, first and second Continental Congresses, 1774, 1775 in Philadelphia. John Adams, if I ask you to name three founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, how many of us would say first John Adams? I am here to tell you do not sleep on John Adams. I, uh, the, the guy was unbelievable. To put it in today's terms, when I read David McCullough's book of John Adams, how much bandwidth can a person have? It was unbelievable. Think of him being on horseback just to get to Philadelphia. Through the snow and the sleet, and I read another account of it today. It took the better part of two weeks. 
to get down there to fulfill his commitment on horseback. I mean, what he, what he went through. I mean, it was John Adams that quickly realized that the makeup of the Congress was one-third Tory or loyalist to Great Britain. One-third uncommitted, like a willow tree, going both ways, whichever side's ahead. And then one-third patriots. He quickly figured that out. It was John Adams that in 1775 recommended and nominated George Washington to be the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, when everything would have indicated that it should be somebody from Massachusetts. John, we're on the front line here. You wouldn't nominate one of our own? No, we're going to nominate George Washington. Well, he's how many hundreds of miles away from the conflict? John Adams was perceptive. He realized how important Virginia was to the whole of the colony support. And Virginia was the dominant colony. It was John Adams that insisted that Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence. Everybody said, John, you write it. No, 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 no. Because he could have written it. No, no. I defer to Thomas Jefferson. He should write it. He's a better writer. And I want Virginia involved. I want Virginia to have some skin in the game. John Adams was brilliant. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from George Washington or Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson. But when you read the history, it's clear. John Adams is really an unsung hero. Of course, he was our second president. And surprise, surprise, his son was our sixth president. Okay, so I mentioned the Boston campaign. There were three parts to it. Lexington and Concord, the Battle of Bunker Hill, Siege of Boston. Over about an 11 month period, again, long before the Declaration of Independence. Understand that a lot of those delegates at the Continental Congress, a lot of them felt the attitude was, hey Massachusetts, you guys are having trouble with, with the British, that's your deal. That's not our deal. That's your problem. That, that sentiment existed. Okay? So, the shot heard around the world, Lexington and Concord. My Jonathan Brewer owned a tavern. When the British sent out scouts to figure out the path back from Concord, back to Boston, they had a beer. And Colonel Jonathan, my, my ancestor's tavern that he owned in Waltham. It's documented. It's fact. It's, it's, just, it's just pretty cool to see that. But the siege of Boston, there were people who felt that on March 17, 1776, when the British evacuated Boston, people thought, we won the war. <laughs> Little did they realize it was just getting started. So, George Washington, this is a picture of George Washington accepting the command of the American Army, it says there, on July 3rd, 1775. It was based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'll show you here on a map where Cambridge, in relationship to where Bunker Hill and it all occurred here, and some maps that are coming. But understand, these results in the Boston campaign fueled the belief, fueled the confidence that yes, we can. We can do this. In NCAA basketball terms, it was a one versus a 16. That's what the perception was. That the, colon, the, the colonial army against the British, it'd be like the far college tornadoes against the Duke Blue Devils. That was the perception. They're just but this, these events were the game changer. The belief that we can do it. Well, there he is. So, full disclosure, full disclosure, my dad, my son, and I went on a trip last September, and I'll show you the slide here in a minute. This picture of Colonel Jonathan, I don't know what it's based on. But there, is, there are three taverns 
in Waltham and Medford, I can't think of the other town. But there's this, there's a chain of three taverns in that part of Massachusetts. It's called John Brewer's Tavern. Recognizing my direct ancestor. And that is kind of in their logo. When you walk into the tavern, you think I can get a free beer in there. <laughs> but no. It's six bucks. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, handsome guy, but I don't know really honestly what it's based on, but that is in the ta at least three taverns in Massachusetts. That is the featured piece of art. So again, as I mentioned earlier, a veteran of the French and Indian War, Battle of Bunker Hill, a contemporary, fought right alongside William Prescott, Dr. Joseph Warren. I mean, there are documents, George Washington orders where he's mentioned by name. He went on the New York and New Jersey campaign and followed the, the Boston campaign. It's, it's very gratifying to look in the record and see that. I think, my goodness. And then this quote is just off the chart. That Colonel Brewer is the biggest sense man I know, but as rough as a grizzly bear. Robert Tree Payne, signer of the Declaration of Independence. I have to do some work at the weight room, but I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. It's a small, it's, it, it, what it tells you is, it's a, it was such a small world then. Everybody kind of knew everybody. George Washington knew who Colonel Jonathan Brewer was. He did. It's a fact. There's no doubt about it. And that's pretty cool, to, 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 just to reflect on that. And then his son, who's mentioned down, whoops, got ahead of myself. His son, who's mentioned right there, Francis, was his valet and actually received Revolutionary War credit, which is pretty cool. And it was when Francis, his son, moved to Pennsylvania, is then where my family, as you can see here, there it is, there's the colonel, Francis, his son, moved to Pennsylvania, and then that started a string of all Pennsylvanians. Okay? Even my son was born in Pennsylvania. And there we are, John Brewer's Tavern. It's unbelievable to walk in there and think, my goodness. It's right across the street from where my ancestors' real tavern was. It's across the street. I know that for a fact. It's unbelievable. So just real quick here, you can see Overfield Cemetery, Overfield Cemetery, Overfield, Overfield, Overfield. Well, he's, he's sitting back there, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I won't fill that one out yet. But, um, but I was very close to my grandfather. Very close to him. So when it came time, where am I going to be planted? Is there any, is there any doubt? <laughs> thankfully there was, Cindy. I got like the last plot. No, but, but thankfully there was. But I mean, it's a no doubt. One, two, three, four, five, six generations will be in there. So. So here was our trip. Here was our trip to Boston. Um, I, I, I'm not lying when I said I felt every bit of it. Because I, I had read it, and you walked that ground, can't not be swept up in it. I mean, to see, to see a plaque like that, Brewer's Regiment, there it is. All the captains that served under him. Seriously. Wow. You've got to paint your breath away. And to walk through these cemeteries and to see all the Revolutionary War dead, it's, it's very humbling. So I would encourage anyone, you know, if you, if you have a chance, there's, of course, the Bunker Hill Monument. There's Dad and my son in front of it. So, okay. I told my wife, where are we at on time? What time is it? Oh, not bad. 2.32. Okay. Okay. So,
Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill or Breeds Hill? Seriously? Most of the fighting, almost like 90% of it occurred on Breeds Hill. It's even this name. Talk about confusion. Okay, so here's a map, and I have other maps in here. Here is, Boston is over here in this area. So there's Bunker Hill. That's Breeds Hill. Here's where the British landed. Bunker Hill is 110 feet high. Breeds Hill is 62. When they came across the neck, they made the game time decision to put the in-ground fort on Breeds Hill. The battle wasn't even fought on Bunker Hill. Very confusing uh, point, and I would say that William Prescott, in conjunction with Colonel Ridley, made that decision. It was later termed to be a mistake, as it says there in the notes, but nonetheless, Breed's Hill, the most forward hill, was actually where the, most of the fighting occurred. Bunker Hill was a backup. I thought this slide was so important to understanding the, the terrain. So this is, this is a map of what it looked like at that time. Look at the neck to Boston. Look at the neck to Charlestown. Now, look at all this light brown is as it exists today. All the land fill, filling around it and building out, taking away all that water. So you don't need to be a military genius to know that when they fought back in those, in those times, these nets were critical. Because if you couldn't get through that neck, you're stuck there unless you want to swim. I mean, it, it, it's very, it, it's very, I have no idea if I would go into this. So I think this really illustrates, in terms of strategy, the nets. So, organized army or mob? Minutemen. Minute. Okay. I want to read this. Now, this is a book that I bought when I was in Charlestown. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. When I bought this book, I started to read it, and I thought, oh my gosh, you've made a mistake. It's too dense. It was written by a 19th century author. It's very wordy. It's kind of dense. And I put it aside for about a month. Then I pulled it back out. And said, Give it a little bit more time. Really read it. Pretty soon I realized this book is indispensable. This book was written by George Ellis, who was the, the first president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He spent half of his life trying to pin down what happened on that day. And I want to read to you his take on Minutemen. Our troops were Minutemen, extemporized into fragmentary companies and skeleton regiments. They came unbidden at an alarm from the bell on the reading house, or from a post rider, or from the telegrams transmitted by tongue and ear. And they came for what they were, and as they were, with their light summer clothing, in shirt and frock and apron, with what was left from their last meals in their pantries, packed in a few notions in a sack or a pillowcase, and with ducking guns and fowling pieces or shaky muskets, used in old times against the vermin and game in the woods. And for the most part, they were free to go away as they had been to come. When we think about the Revolutionary War, we typically think about those minutemen, the early stages in our mind's eye. We don't think so much about the Continental Army as we do the minutemen. And this, as it says here, is in Lexington Concord. So that army that was assembled in Cambridge, 15,000, 15,000, of which 10,000 were Massachusetts, the other 5,000 were Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Vermont was not a colony. I know they were not a colony. They were there. But Vermont was not recognized as a colony. Okay, back to 
this question. Who was in charge? Well, the predecessor to George Washington, for all intent and purposes, was this gentleman, Artemis Ward. No one debates that he was based in Cambridge, and he was the overseer, certainly, of the Massachusetts contingent. The question is, who called the shots that day on the Charlestown Peninsula? And that's where the debate has raged on literally for decades. So the highest ranking officer killed that day was this guy right here, Dr. Joseph Warren. I need a drink of water. So Dr. Joseph Warren, some historians have said that if he had not been killed at Bunker Hill and he had survived the revolution, he may very well have been the first president. That's pretty heavy stuff. But unfortunately, he died a martyr's death at Bunker Hill. His body was pierced countless times with bayonets. He was identified by his false teeth. It was terrible. And But he was the highest ranking officer killed that day in the Battle of Bunker Hill. And he was killed in the in-ground fort that was built on Breed's Hill. So naturally, in the days following, it was assumed, well, he, he was. Major, Major General Joseph Warren was killed in, in the redoubt. He was calling the shots. When in reality, he had reported for duty. He had just received his officer's commission uh, like three or four days earlier. And he realized, as popular as he was and involved in the government as he was, he realized when it came to military tactics, he deferred, smartly so, to William Prescott. He reported to the readout and said, look, I'm a private. I'm just here to serve. So he really had no say in the strategy that day. But again, that was all had to be unraveled. And then I can't really get into all this, but for literally for decades, people thought Israel Putnam was the one who really called the shots. And uh, not really. It was Prescott. And that gets into Putnam was from Connecticut. And if you're familiar with the famous uh, John Trumbull painting of Bunker Hill, it portrays Israel Putnam front and center in the redoubt or the in-ground fort. What state do you think Trumbull was from? Connecticut. And he and he knew Putnam. Putnam was a Putnam was like a, a folk hero. He was beloved, and he was courageous, and he was brave, and he was tough. But the reality of it was, he was eight years older than Prescott at the time of the battle. And quite frankly, he held back. He was on Bunker Hill, trying to get reinforcements, trying to get provisions, trying to support. And I'll get more, maybe into that a little bit more. But really, it was Prescott that carried the day. So don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Who said it? It's been attributed to Prescott. It's been attributed to Putnam. It's been attributed to Stark of New Hampshire. But most history books will say that Prescott said it. Where it really came from was what I'm calling their firing strategy. They had a very limited amount of powder and ammunition. And they had to make every shot count. So to that end, Aim low. Don't fire until they're six to eight rods away. A rod equals 16.5 feet. Shots fired in three ways rather than two. And boy, did that take the bridge by surprise. Fire. Fire. And then they think, now is when we make our charge because they're reloading. Ah, ah. We got a third way. And they just chopped them right down. So I want to go back. I missed the reading here that I meant to read. I want to get back to Prescott real quick. So I want you to hear this. So this is again out of Ellis's book regarding Prescott. Prescott was the hero of that blood died summit, the midnight leader and guard, the morning sentinel, the orator of the opening strife, the cool and deliberate overseer of the whole struggle, 
the well-skilled marksman of the exact distance and the point at which a shot was certain death. He was the trusted chief in whose bright eye and steady nerve men read their duty, and when conduct, skill, and courage could do no more, he was the merciful deliverer of the remnant. Prescott was the hero of the day, and wherever its tale is told, let him be its chieftain. So we know how to are jealous about it. Okay, so firing strategy. They got very close. So now we're into the evening and early morning hours of the 16th. So on the 16th, the day before the battle, Prescott and about a thousand men were massed in Cambridge. They had received their orders from Artemis Ward. They received a prayer, if you believe this or not, they received a prayer from the president of Harvard College, sent them off with a solemn prayer into the battle. They, they marched from Cambridge across that neck that, that, that we showed you, and at about midnight, they started digging the in-ground fort on Breed's Hill, not Buckner Hill. So at about, at about between 4 and 5 in the morning, the British see what's happening. Word had gotten out about four days earlier that the British were going to take, try to take the high ground around Boston, which would have been Dorchester Heights, the Charlestown Peninsula, and the Colonials beat them to the punch. And that's why they had a sense of urgency about getting on that peninsula and establishing themselves. So the British realized this, and right at about 5 o'clock, with their ships in the bay there, begin to lob in bombs, or cannonballs, which are mostly, which are mostly ineffective. Two really have an effect. The first soldier killed in Bunker Hill was Asa Pollard, and you're in that fort, you know a lot of those militia are young, are young boys, let's face it, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're scared. They know what they're up against. Here come the red coats. Here come the cannonballs. And sure enough, only two really, really had any devastation. But the one that killed Ace and Pollard decapitated him. It was awful. And all of the young soldiers are there. And this is when you talk about Prescott. It was Prescott that then realized, with that kind of a, a death, that I could lose my army right here. And he gets up on top of the ridge. He gets up on top of this ridge, <coughs> and he goes up and down. Dig, boys, let's go, dig, we can do this. And he just right away, right, does the exact opposite of what everybody else would have done. Everybody would have seen the death of Pollard, and whoa, not Prescott. He got right up on that ridge and he kept encouraging them. There's nothing to worry about. That was a one in a million. And it, and it really was kind of only one of the two shots. The other shot, the other cannonball, knocked out their water supply, which was just of all the freak, you know, terrible luck. And that, that did prove to be critical because they, they, they were just dying of thirst the whole day. So let me read. This is a letter from Peter Brown of Westford, Massachusetts, to his, to his mother on June 28, 1775. And about half after five in the morn, we not having a, about half the fort done, they began to fire. I suppose as soon as they had orders pretty briskly for a few minutes, and then stopped, and then again. They killed one of us, Asa Pollard. And then they ceased until about 11 o'clock. And then it became pretty brisk again. And that caused some of our young country people to desert. Apprehending the danger in a clearer manner than the rest, who were more diligent in digging and fortifying ourselves against them, we began to be almost beat out, being tired by our labor, and having no sleep the night before, little food, no drink, but rum. They had rum. No food. <laughs> 
So most historians say the Battle of Bunker Hill was three assaults, three attacks. Occasionally, you'll see it talked about in, in, four, in four attacks, but typically it's thought of to be three. I want to show you this next map. Because this map, to me, this is the best map I have found. So here's Breed's Hill. Here's the Ingram Fort. The British, from the time they recognized the colonists were on that hill, they delayed. And that delay was costly. If they would have attacked right away, they would have caught Prescott without these flanks protected. But the delay enabled Prescott to build out this breastwork, get this rail fence along to the water, and then my ancestor, that's also from the tavern, fought on the diagonal right here. Fought in the open ground. I mean, he was wounded in battle. His lieutenant, his lieutenant, Colonel was his brother-in-law. He was seriously wounded. And they fought right on that diagonal, right there. They got there about an hour, maybe an hour and a half before the battle, and Prescott said, get in there, right there. Sounds like a fun assignment. You're fighting in the open. That's one. You're fighting in the open. So um, the reason I like this map is, are you familiar with Stark and Knowlton? There used to be a legal uh, the lawyers in Akron, Ohio called Stark and Nolan. Where did they get that name? They got that name from the two who stood the line on that rail fence. Nolan of Connecticut was supported by Stark of New Hampshire. Live free or die, Stark of New Hampshire. It's the state model of New Hampshire. Stark also was a veteran of the French and Indian War. And when the British, in the first assault, came at the in-ground fort here, Howe tried to lead along the shoreline the British to come around and outflank, get in behind them. Stark had a little surprise in store. He took his best marksmen right down to the waterline. They hid behind a stone wall. The British had no idea. They got to within about six to eight rods, and he chopped them down, just under 100. 96 hit the deck right there, right in that spot, right there. Yes, if they would have gotten around that water line and gotten in behind the fort, game over. But thankfully, Stark, who got there late, if the British had not delayed or chosen a different strategy, and that the tides figured into it, why they delayed high tide, low tide, all these things factored into the thinking. But I think, to me, what factored into it more than anything, honestly, was arrogance. They thought they could march up that hill, and those hillbillies would just turn and run. They're too scared. They're just going to run. And they were wrong. Most of them stood in there and fought. So that map, I just love this map. To know right there is where Colonel Jonathan fought his regiment. Part of his regiment. 165 fought there. He had 321. He had 321 in his charge. I must be getting a call from the Colonel in my bed. But um, he had 321 in his charge, and 165 fought right there. So this, I love these pictures because they give you a little different perspective. So here again, we're up on Breed's Hill. Here's the in-ground fort, at least one drawing of it. And I read an account just within the last week of a man who wrote this that 25 years after the battle played, as a boy, played in what was left of that fort. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, as a youngster in the early 1800s. But that gives you an idea of what it was like. 
And then I love this picture because this gives you, and again, it's an artist, it's a painting, whatever, but here's green till. This is what they call the rail fence, the breast, the breastwork to the water. So that picture is right here. You follow me? That right there, there's Green Hill. Here's the British coming in. Okay? I think that's meant to be Israel Putnam. But that's where Stark and Knowlton made their mark on that fence. And they were unbelievable in retreat. They protected in retreat, too. They were really unsung heroes, too. So I really love those two pictures. So the first two assaults, the British delay, poor strategy. It gives Prescott time to build out and protect his flanks. We talked about this, Stark and Knowlton firing in three ranks at a distance of about eight rods, which would be about uh, 135 feet. Yes, they did. That's right. They put distance markers. That's exactly right. They put distance markers out there and said, do not fire until they hit that marker. And then somebody would jump the gun and shoot too early. And then there was even on record, I'll run you through if you don't obey. <laughs> they were very strict on it because they had to conserve, had to make every shot count. Because in the end, they lose the ground because they run out of ammunition. And then flash again. They lose the ground because of ammunition. That's why. If they would have had powder and ammunition, the British never would have took Breed's Hill. But they ran out, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay? So the British were taking sniper fire from Charlestown. We're taking sniper fire, sniper fire from Charlestown. And that's when they set Charlestown on fire. Putnam, unsuccessful in moving reinforcements, water, supplies, really after the battle had begun, there just was nothing. The second British assault, they switched the distance from eight yards to six. I just want to read, read this. But the enemy landed in front of before us and formed themselves in an oblong square so as to surround us, which they did. After they were well formed, they advanced toward us in order to swallow us up. But they found a choky mouthful of us. I love how he writes. They cut them down in okay, those first two waves. This again is that letter from the ground. So this is important too. The British got pounded in those first two assaults. They made a third because word leaked out that the provincial army was running out of ammunition and gunpowder, and they knew that. And they thought, we can make a charge that they don't have enough, and that is, is in fact what happened. Third assault. At this point, we've got about 150 to 200 in the readout. The British had received about 400 reinforcements. The Redcoats affixed their bayonets, came up over the wall, gunpowder, the ammunition was gone, and now it's hand to hand. The colonial soldiers, the provincial army, are swinging their muskets. They are throwing stones. And, I mean, just think about that. And this, this painting, a lot of the paintings are, eh. This one, oh my goodness. Probably not that far off. Let me just read this real quick. Peter Brown again. If we should be called into action again, I hope to have the courage and strength to act my part valiantly in defense of our liberties, liberties and our country, trusting in him who hath yet kept me and hath covered my head in the day of battle. And though we have lost four of our company, and our lieutenant's thigh is broken, and he's been taken captive by the cruel enemies of America. I was not suffered to be touched, although I was in the fort till the regulars, the British, came in and I jumped over the wall and ran for about a half a mile, where the balls flew like hailstones and the cannons roared like thunder. Oh, 
I want to read this. I know my time is running low, but it's, some of this is pretty good here. I'm going to read this to you. This was a poem. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine poems, orations, ballads written about this battle all during the 1800s. Not yet, not yet, steady, steady. On came the foe in even line, nearer and nearer to Price's, Price paces nine. We looked into their eyes, ready, a sheet of flame, a roll of death. They felt by scores, we held our breath. Then nearer still they came, another sheet of flame, and brave men fled who had never fled before. Immortal fight, foreshadowing flight, back to astounded shore. How Burgoyne, Clinton, Gage, stormed with commander's rage. Into each empty barge, they crowded fresh men for a new charge up that great hill. Again, their gallant blood we spill. That volley was the last, our powder failed. On three sides fast, the foe pressed in. Nor quail the man, their barrels empty with musket stocks. They fought and gave death-dealing knocks. Till Prescott ordered the retreat, then Warren fell and threw a leaden sleet. From Bunker Hill and Breed, Stark, Putnam, Pomeroy, Milton, and Reed, let off the remnant of those heroes true, the foe too shattered to pursue. George Henry Tower, written in the 1800s. Very good. And then what I'll do is, we're we right out of time. Yes. Very good. I'll read this last, I'll read this last bit from George Ellis and we'll call it quits and take some questions. Because to me, this is really, this really captures it. They lack discipline, artillery, bayonets, powder and ball, food and the greatest want of all. They lack the delicious draft of pure, cool water for their labor-worn and heat-exhausted frames. They found that desperation would supply the place of discipline, that the blunt end of a musket wielded with strong arms might be as deadly as the thrust of a bayonet, and that a heavy stone might level an assailant as well as a charge of powder. As for food and water, the hunger they were compelled to bear unrelieved, and they cooled their brows only by the thick, heavy drops which poured before the sun. Yet it was their opening combat, and proudly did they bear away its laurels, even upon their backs, which the failure of ammunition and reinforcements compelled them through part of their retreat to turn to the enemy. They did show their backs once to those who had already twice indulged them with the same spectacle. And if they retreated, it was not in abandonment of their cause, but that they might save their faces for later and bolder opportunities of confronting the foe. Their opening battle decided the spirit and the hope of all the subsequent campaigns. They had freed themselves during the engagement. From all that human reluctance they had heretofore felt in turning deadly weapons against the breast of former friends, yes, even of kinsmen. On that eminence, that first bright image of liberty, of a free native land, kindled the eyes of those who were expiring in their gore. And the image passed between the living and the dying to seal the covenant that the hope of the one or the fate of the other should unite them here or hereafter. Wow. I've got more, but I'm going to stop it right there um, and take questions because I'm
Now, most of the, most of the uh, English shots were going high to the point where tops of trees were taken off and the top, top <laughs> flags were taken off. And the third volley, you can imagine, was coming out of this smoke. I mean, and it really broke the hearts of the English. The baby. Now, what happened on that shoreline, there was a, th that is exactly what happened. The shots all went high and Stark just mowed them down. And that was like, uh oh, this is. And he had his best marksman this, on the shoreline. Yes, he did. He had his best marksman on the shoreline. And again, that's where that French and Indian War experience, military experience, Stark, these people were tough as nails. And you read about their lives and what they endured. Yes? He's still on. So Bunker Hill is where they staged most of the, was to be like the reinforcing hill. Israel Putnam, who really only appears in the in-ground fort, really wants to retrieve the shovels and entrenching tools. But he, he goes back to Bunker Hill. That's kind of like the midpoint to kind of, supposedly was to get the reinforcements, the water, the food to the, up to the soldiers. And that didn't really happen. Uh, one of the sad things that happened to, I didn't get to mention it, to your point, massing on Bunker Hill was Colonel Thomas Gardner of Massachusetts. He was the second highest ranking officer killed from the colonial side. He was chomping at the bit, his 300 men to get up in that redoubt and support Prescott. And this is at about 3 o'clock. He knows the battle is on and he's Chopping at the bit to get out there. And he's shot by like a random shot. And it takes him down. He's actually shot below the waist. And it takes him down. And this shows you the importance of leadership. And he got shot. Everybody's interested in getting out to the fence, uh, up, up to the in-ground fort. Just got it figured out, and they never supported it. It did not go. But if Gardner and his 300 men had gotten to that, then again, it had a whole different deal. So he was the second highest ranking after Dr. Warren to be killed. Question? Yes, sir. Uh, you spent about an hour entertaining us. How many hours would you estimate that you spent to do for all this research you did? Quite a few. Because <laughs> like I said, it's a top. Anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> no, but, but I really, I really believe I've been so caught up in this that I really do believe that going forward, I would like to go into you know, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, because I sense that we do need some historical perspective in our schools and have it taught this way. I've got teaching experience, and I know I can do it. And, and it was kind of like an investment in future talks. So I knew this wasn't a one and done. But I did put a lot into it, but I know I'm gonna go back to it down the road when I hopefully talk to Brevard High School or Middle School. We'll see if I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Do you favor a listing the student files of those who fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill? Yes. Where is that <laughs> well, in this book it has a listing of all those who were killed. Oh, okay. But it, it does exist. There are, it's unbelievable to see the old style documents handwritten. Yeah, all the, yeah, they do, they do, they do exist. Yep, I, you, it's, it's amazing. Again, this morning I went back and read it again. 320 that were in Colonel Jonathan Brewer's regiment. It's just, it's mind blowing. These guys are all volunteers, and volunteers are gonna, do hand to hand against bayonets? Yeah, stop it. Just consider that. Consider how brave an 18, 19, 20 year old is to be in that fort. Because like, a lot of the veterans of the French and Indian War had seen war and battle up close. And that's where a Prescott with his calming influence, stick in there, lads, stick in there. Because they, a lot of them, wanted to just up out of here. And it was Prescott that really stood in there and 
got them to stay. The ones that did. Because some digital, and understandably so, you're looking out at just waves of red coats coming at you with those gleaming bayonets in the sun, thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And the Minutemen were chosen by, by congregations of people meeting in town hall meetings where, where members of family were chosen, like uh, Moses and James and John Campbell uh, in Westfield. They were chosen by their families to go. And they were the, the oldest in the families, and they carried the, the equipment, the rifles, the, the shot, the powder, and everything with them. They were ready to go for any and minutes notice. And then, let's face it, the wives and mothers were nurses so this and parents and moms. Yeah. So, I just want to show you this real quick. So one of the black soldiers that fought, when he was received a commendation, 14 officers signed it right at the top. Colonel Jonathan Brewer. Are you kidding me? Salem Fort. They made, they made, a, they made a stamp. In 1975, in honor of Salem Ford, because of his commendation he received after the battle in December of 1775, signed by William Prescott and Colonel Jonathan Brewer were the two highest ranking officials to sign that commendation for Salem Ford. So, one more question. Ruth. Well, first of all, Jonathan Brewer definitely looks like Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, I think they were overconfident. Number two, I think the tides played into it. Because they, they wanted they wanted it to be a high tide to get their, their long boats in with the soldiers. And Gage was calling the shots. And he had been the um, military governor and just had a very low opinion. They really thought if they marched up that hill, they were just going to turn tail. And overconfident was part of the two, I think. Okay? Thank you very much.